hope is that God has been gracious to you throughout the week. It is another Sabbath that our Lord has given unto us, so that we may rest, rejoice, and be glad in it. This is New Life Show from Adventist World Radio, the voice of hope. I am your host, Tileno Diam. In today's Bible story, we are going to learn how God was able to give Adam a companion while he was in the Garden of Eden. Later on, the man of God, Pastor Kigundun Duiga, will be joining us during the Bible segment as he will be sharing with us on Wars and Rumors of Wars. Just before we get into all those wonderful items, here are some great melodious tunes just for you. that you are enjoying the show. When God created Adam, he saw it was best if he would have a companion to be with him in the Garden of Eden. Let us listen to the Bible in living sound to find out more about Adam's companion. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh thereof, And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. Wake up, Adam. Wake up. Uh, uh, What is it? Where am I? Thou art in the garden as before. I feel so strange. but, But who is that creature over there by the lake? Well, she's like me. She, she has arms and legs like mine, and <laughs> she's smiling. The Lord God has made thee an helpmate, Adam. He has fashioned her from one of thy ribs. Oh, she's beautiful. What wilt thou call her? Oh, she is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. She has seen thee. Go. Go. Speak to her. I am Adam. I know not who I am, nor what I am. You're a woman. Have I no name? No name of my own? I will call you Eve. Does the name please you? Eve. Eve. Yes, I... I like it very much. (laughs) What is this place? It's the Garden of Eden. The Lord God who created us has given it to us for our home. It's very lovely. 
so green and peaceful. What's that creature coming toward us? Huh? The one with the long neck. Oh, it's a giraffe. And that one over there. An antelope. Oh, how gracefully it runs. <laughs> how beautiful everything is. Tell me everything about the garden, Adam. Huh? I want to know the names of all the trees and the flowers, all the birds and animals. <laughs> oh, that'll take quite some time. Still, I'll try. Uh, see those trees? The small red berries on the trees are called cherries. Oh. They're very good to eat. And those birds, I named them swallows. Oh, what's the name of these flowers? Oh, they're violets. Oh, no, 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 I'm wrong. They're daisies. <laughs> it's all a bit new to me, too, you know. Let's go on. I, I want to see what's on the other side of this hill. And Adam and Eve walked through the Garden of Eden. And Adam told her the name of every living creature in it, as well as the name of all the things that grew there. Adam? Yes, Eve? There's a certain tree. We've walked past it a number of times. Why haven't you told me its name? Have you forgotten it? No, I haven't forgotten it is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God has given us permission to eat of the fruit of every tree, except that one. I wonder why. He told me that if we ate of its fruit, we would surely die. Well, children, that brings us almost to the end of the story of Creation Week. But there is one more thing the Bible tells us. Would you like to read it, Johnny? Here, the first three verses of the second chapter of Genesis. Thanks, Dad. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Good, Johnny. Do you understand what it means? Yes, Dad. It means God gave us a day for rest. Now, why do you suppose he did that? I guess he felt tired after all the work he did. Oh, I don't believe God ever gets tired. He gave us a day of rest so that we can worship him and thank him for all that he does for us. That's it. We work six days and rest from our work on the seventh and go to church to thank him for all his blessings. And we have so much to be thankful for. This wonderful earth that he gave us. The chance to make good lives for ourselves and for those we love. Sound, healthy bodies and minds. All the joy and happiness that come to us just because we are alive. But, Dad... What about people who are sick or who lose someone they love in an accident? People get in all kinds of trouble, you know. I mean, well, people aren't all happy. Everyone has to learn to accept sorrow that comes to them from the outside. Besides, there's always something to be thankful for, even when you are sad. Of course, lots of people get into trouble because they do wrong. Why does God let trouble come to people? Well, the Bible explains that, Pat. It'll be the next story in our records. Want to listen to it? Oh, yes, oh, please. In case you feel like contributing something in form of ideas to this program, feel free to write to the producer, Adventist World Radio, P.O. Box, 42276, code 00100, Nairobi, Kenya. Our email address is awrnairobi at eau.adventist.org.
program coming to you from Adventist World Radio, the voice of hope. I am your presenter, Tileno Diambo. How can one describe wars and rumors of wars? Well, let us give the man of God, Pastor Kigundu, to enlighten us on the topic, wars and rumors of wars. The first sign of divine judgment given by Christ in his Olivet Discourse is the occurrence of wars. In Matthew 24, verse 6 to 8, he said, And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. All this is the beginning of sufferings. So as to appreciate the significance of this Advent sign for this time, we'll consider the prophetic teaching regarding end time intensification of warfare, and then we will assess the fulfillment of this Advent sign during this present time. Jesus alluded to the intensification of wars and other disasters when he described them as the beginning of wars. What Jesus mentioned in passing, other prophetic writers described in details. In the visions of prophet Daniel as recorded in chapter 2 and 7, Daniel sees a succession of kingdoms in which warfare intensifies in extent and brutality and destruction. The fourth kingdom is depicted as a political power that shall devour the whole earth and trample it down and break it to pieces. That is in Daniel 2 verse 40, Daniel 7 verse 23. Similarly, in chapter 12, verse 1, Daniel speaks of a final time when there will be a time of trouble such as never had been since there was a nation till that time. The intensification of warfare before the coming of Christ is portrayed dramatically in several visions of the book of Revelation. In the vision of the four horsemen in Revelation chapter 6, Each of the four horses that appear at the opening of the four seals depict in a crescendo the intensification of war and its consequences. 
The white horse that goes out to conquer in Revelation 6 verse 2 alludes to war because there can be no conquest without war. The red horse that follows it has a rider who was given power to take peace from earth and to make men slay each other. To him was given a large sword. Revelation 6 verse 4. This description obviously refers to war and bloodshed. The red horse, which is followed by the black horse, is described as carrying a rider who has a pair of scales in his hands and weighing food thus representing scarcity, an acute famine that is caused by wars. The last horse, the pale horse, has a rider whose name is Death. They are given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine, and plague, and wild beasts. The various means used by the last horse, the pale horse, to cause death suggests an intensification of the destructiveness of war. The extent of the destruction is depicted as the fourth of the earth, Revelation 6 verse 8. This phrase expresses not only the intensification of warfare, but also the glorious news that there is a limitation placed by God upon the destructiveness of war. The good news is that the Lord will not allow the whole world to be destroyed by wars. It is His coming that will cause the final and complete destruction of the wicked. The extension and the intensification of wars before the coming of Christ are depicted in Revelation also in conjunction with the sixth plague, which describes the preparation for the final end-time battle known as the Battle of Armageddon. That is recorded in Revelation 16, verse 14 to 16. The Bible describes deceiving demonic spirits that will go out to the kings of the whole world and gather them together for the battle of the great day of God Almighty. One theologian, Henry Sweet, commented, There have been times when nations have been seized by passion for war which the historians can but imperfectly explain. It is such an epoch that the seer foresees, but one which, unlike any that has come before it, will involve the whole world in war. The preparation for this worldwide war takes place prior to the coming of Christ, which is clearly described by the verse that follows. Behold, I come like a thief. Blessed is he who stays awake and keeps his clothes with him, so that he may not go naked and shamefully exposed. Revelation 16 verse 15 This prediction of a final worldwide military conflict before the end can be traced back to the Old Testament prophets. Joel, for example, foretells the coming of a great and a terrible day of the Lord when God will gather all the nations in the valley of Jehoshaphat and execute judgment upon them for their brutality against God's people Israel. That is recorded in Joel 3 verse 2. Similar descriptions of a final conflict involving a gathering of nations against Israel are found in Zechariah 14 verse 1 to 5 and Ezekiel chapter 38 and chapter 39. God intervenes in this climactic global conflict, executing judgment upon the ungodly nations of the world. What the Old Testament prophesied about a final conflict of the nations which are destroyed by the Lord Jesus when he comes to establish his messianic kingdom, becomes in John's revelation the final worldwide conflict, that is Armageddon, which is brought to an end by the coming of the King of kings and Lord of lords, who destroys all evildoers and inaugurates a new heaven and a new earth. The question now comes, has this pre-advent intensification of war found fulfillment in our times? Some would answer in the negative because wars have been a sad reality in every period of human history. Indeed, no one can dispute the fact that wars have plagued mankind in every age. As such, their constant occurrence has been assigned to believers in every age that the coming of the Lord is not in the remote future. However, we need to recognize that though wars have been in existence, it is a fact that in the last one century, wars have become increasingly global and more destructive. It is only in the last century, the 20th century, that two world wars have been fought which have no parallels in history pertaining to geographical extent and the destruction of human lives and property. Almost 30 nations took part in World War I. 
It is estimated that this war resulted to the death of twice as many men as all the major wars from 1790 to 1913 put together. It resulted to the death of 9 million military personnel. About 5 million civilians lost their lives in this war. To add insult to injury, 10 of millions of lives died as a result of the Spanish influenza which was caused by the war. Mankind had never before experienced a war causing such an incredible destruction of human lives and property as World War I. The absurd thing is that after a merely 20 years, a war that caused far greater human and material loss than World War I or any previous war broke out. The paradox about mankind is the inability to learn from past mistakes. More than 50 countries took part in this horrendous war. The World War II that caused the death of over 55 million civilian and military persons. No other war ever caused so much damage to key industries, transport and housing in so many parts of the world as World War II. Never before had mankind experienced such a global devastation on such a massive scale. The global extent and destructiveness of the two world wars which have caused more casualties than all the previous wars of history combined, are an unparalleled fulfillment of the predicted intensification and expansion of war before Christ's coming. Are the two world wars already witnessed in this century a prelude to another worldwide conflict, World War III, which could be the final battle of Armageddon of Revelation 16 verse 14 to 16? There are many that reject such a prospect. They are of the opinion that the more than 50 years since World War II of relative peace and the fact that the arms race seems to have slowed down and the Cold War abandoned are an indication that mankind has learned the folly of engaging in wars. It is difficult to share in that optimistic view because a closer look will actually show that mankind has not changed. In spite of the creation of the UN on October 24th, 1945 to create a lasting peace, there have been over some 140 bloody conflicts in which perhaps over 10 million people have been killed. A survey reported by US News and World Report recorded that even today, at a time when much of the world seems to be at peace, no fewer than a fourth of the nations around the globe are caught up in armed conflicts. More than 40 countries are involved in hostilities of one form or another that have claimed as many as 5 million lives. All around the globe, fighting never ends. In the light of the present proliferation of national and revolutionary wars, it is hard to discount the possibility of a new world war conflict breaking out sometime in the future. There are many now that are breathing a sigh of relief because the Cold War and the related tension seems to have thawed away. It does seem like the world is becoming a global village. However, we must not become optimistic about man's ability to bring peace on earth. The Bible warns us about the folly of putting our trust in man and his promises because man changes like the waves of the sea. The human heart, sad to say, is very unpredictable. Paul warns us in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 3 to be careful of feeling at ease and dropping our guards at the present illusion of peace because while people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman and they will not escape. It is true that the prospects of a future global confrontations appear very real today. The increasing socio, economic, and political tensions in many parts of the world, coupled with the presence of conventional and nuclear weapons, could easily drag the world into an unwanted worldwide conflict. Such a conflict could very well be the apocalyptic battle of Armageddon, or at least a prelude to it. The end of the world has become a major chorus in movies and books. The message of the secular prophets, who predict the coming of Armageddon, is one of doom and gloom. They see no light at the end of the tunnel. Biblical prophets, on the other hand, see in the final conflict not merely the end, but also the necessary new beginning for the redeemed human race in the new heaven and the new earth. The global extent and destructiveness of war mankind has experienced in the last century, as well as the present increase in conflicts and armaments, are for the believer 
being us that the Lord will soon return to bring an end to the present conflict and wickedness and establish a new order where people shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up swords against nations, neither shall they learn war any more. That is recorded in Isaiah 2 verse 4. We are looking forward to such a world where there will be no more wars. That marks the end of our New Life program today. Be sure to send us your views, comments, and suggestions concerning the program by writing to the producer, Adventist World Radio, P.O. Box 42276, code 00100, Nairobi, Kenya. Our email address is awrnairobi at eau.adventist.org. Have a blessed Sabbath and enjoy the rest of your listening. I have been your host, Tileno Diang. Onward, go.